Right, morning folks, this is uh, Richard Hall here from Stonehenge and uh, looking at the night sky. And I've got a big crowd of people with me at the moment. Um, standing over there is Kay. Say Kay. Kay. Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and Stefan. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice so they're going to be playing some music. And uh, hiding away, there's uh, Keith over there. Good morning. Hello. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, what, we're, what we're planning to do is have, obviously having a look at the night sky that we've got coming, but I should really talk about some of the special programs that we've got coming up over the... Um, the next uh, few days or something like that, isn't it? Well, a bit more, over a <laughs> month, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're going into January, so that's... that's two months. Let's see if yeah. I can go back. Okay. Let's see where we are. Okay. Okay, just to remind you, Stonehenge itself is open, we're open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., yeah. Wednesday to Sunday, up until Christmas, all right? Then we're going to be closed uh, 24th, 25th and 26th. That's our big holiday. And then after that, we're going to be open every day from uh, 10 to 4, okay? But we've also got some very special things happening out there. Number one, we've got uh, the summer solstice is going to be occurring, okay, um, on Thursday the 22nd, all right? And um, so we, and of course, that's also very close to Christmas. So, so we, what we thought we'd do this year is the Star of Bethlehem. So we're going to be looking at the summer solstice, but also what the Star of Bethlehem was and how it's played a major role in the rise of civilization. Right? And people often say, did it really exist or not? Yes, the answer is. So we're going to have a look at it astronomically, what it was as well. Okay, so that's going to be on Thursday, December the 22nd, starting at 8 p.m. Okay? There'll still be some surprises for people. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, you yeah, always got to remember when things are handed down, they get altered a little bit and so on. But there, it was definitely an event. So we're going to be looking at that. And uh, I don't know, Stefan and Keith might come out and play some music for us. It is. Good to, yeah, come out and play some music round at the Henge and that. So afterwards we can go out and have a look at the sunset and so on. All right. So that's the idea behind that. So that's coming up the summer solstice and the Star of Bethlehem on Thursday, December the 22nd. Then going further back, what we've got is um, going into January, we've got star date. All right? And this is being put on by the Phoenix Astronomical Society at Stonehenge. It runs over four days, which is Wellington's long weekend. So that's from uh, January the 20th through to Monday the 23rd. And we're going to have a whole variety of different things. There are going to be talks, viewing. People, some people will be camping out there underneath the stars. There'll be tons and tons of telescopes for you to have a look around. We're going to have music. You name it, barbecues, a whole lot. So it's a astronomy, geology and music weekend. Right, that, That's on the... Wellington's long weekend, Friday, January 20th through to Monday the 23rd. So there's some of the exciting things we've got coming up. Kay? Yeah, you do have to register if you want to come to Stardate. But you can, you know, the details will be up on the webpage. I'll get them up on the webpage or the Phoenix Astronomical Society webpage. Yeah. The registrations beforehand all go through um, the clockwork of the Astronomical Society. Yeah. And you certainly can't camp unless you're registered. That's right, yeah. Okay, right. No freedom camping, eh? Nope. <laughs> oh. Right, anyway, on, on with the night sky. Let's have a look. Oh, we wish to have done all of this. I don't know what's happening with this computer. Let's move on with a little bit. <laughs> it's probably the operator. Who wouldn't suggest <laughs> that, would you? Anyway, let's get into the night sky, first of all. Start off by looking south. Once it gets dark... Um, the most famous uh, constellation in the sky, the Southern Cross, is at its lowest point in the sky. And there it is there, for those of you watching this on, on TV. That's as low as it gets down here in the wire wrapper. Then after that, it's going to get rise higher in the sky. So no matter what day or night of the year that you go out, the Southern Cross will be somewhere in the sky. And of course, the Southern Cross is a major navigational beacon all right, for finding your way south. And you always identify the Southern Cross because it's got those two bright stars that follow it around the sky, and they're called the pointers. Uh, and the brighter of the two pointers is Alpha Centauri, and of course, while that's fascinating, it's the nearest star system beyond our own, right? And 
Whereas a little while ago we were guessing, is there planets? We now know, yes, those, there's, it's got planets. But Alpha Centauri, unlike our, our system, which has only got one star, the sun, uh, there's two bright suns there, and uh, both of them have got planets. And at a greater distance nearby is another star called Proxima, which currently is the closest star to the solar system. Right? Uh, some scientists believe it's part of the Alpha Centauri system, Personally, I don't think it is. I think it's just a close encounter that's going. But we know Proxima has also got planets. There's a little swarm of red stars, aren't there? Red stars, the little red stars are the most common stars in the no, galaxy. No, but in that, in that area, there's a little oh, yeah. cluster of them going yeah. through, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say that, that yeah, the little tiny red dwarf stars are in fact the most common star in the galaxy. It's just that they're so faint, not one of them can be seen with the unaided eye. Right. Most of the stars you see on the night sky, you've got to remember, are not the common garden variety of star. They're giants, all right? And that's, they shine out over great distances and so red, on. Red dwarf stars are, um, as you say, they can't be seen by the naked eye mm. um, or even um, a good optical telescope. Um, Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf. Mm. But if you want to see it, you have to look at it in infrared. Mm because uh, red dwarf stars uh, generate mainly heat. Yeah, and, um, and it's a very explosive star as well. It's subject to violent eruptions where the whole thing can double in brightness very quickly. So, yeah, yeah. not a good place to be. <laughs> good place to go for a holiday. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> OK, so also in our, uh, in our sky, looking south, we have the, the brightest star in the sky, which is Sirius, all right? and that's over towards the east. And also the second brightest star, Canopus. So the two brightest true stars there, Sirius and Canopus, are in our evening sky there. However, and lo oh sorry, looking over towards the west, we've got another bright star, Antares, which is in Scorpion, right? And uh, Antares is really the sign of winter, the Scorpion, and it's, it's setting now So we move, as we move into the summer months and so on. Then at its their highest point in the sky, we have the Magellanic Clouds, right? and so called because they were discovered by Magellan, and they do look like little clouds in the sky. They look like detached portions of the Milky Way, but they're not that at all. They are in fact satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Right? Now the large cloud, um, which I just call the LMC, has a distance of 158,000 light years. Now that might seem a long way away, which it is, but on the scale of galaxies, it's actually quite close. It's a sort of satellite system, right? A satellite of the Milky Way. Yes, that's a, a satellite of the Milky Way. Right, now you're seeing a photograph of it. And the nice thing about the Magellanic Clouds, they are ga other galaxies, but they're close enough even with a relatively small telescope. When I say that small astronomical-wise, you can actually see quite a lot of detail in it. And there, there it is up on the screen for those who are looking at it. And um, it's got a diameter of 14,000 light years. I've got to remember this is small because remember our Milky Way galaxy has got a, a, a diameter of 120,000 light years. All right? And it contains about 30 billion stars. But the interesting thing is we recently with uh, web telescopes and so on, we've actually measured its age. It's only 1.1 billion years old. Now this is this is curious because, you know, that's a tenth the age of our Milky Way galaxy. So this is a baby galaxy. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. You lot interrupt if you want to at any stage. <laughs> okay. One of the most fascinating things to look at in the um, in the large cloud is the Tarantula Nebula. And for those of you watching it on TV, you can see why it's called the tarantula. It, it literally looks like it. It is the biggest star-forming region in this re in this re region of the of the Milky of the galaxy. It's brighter than anything we can see in the Milky Way galaxy. Let's have a close-up look of it. Yeah, it's an absolutely awesome object, and it, it, it it's illuminated by giant stars which are being born within it. And near the centre of the tarantula is a giant cluster of stars which is forming. I'm going to about to bring that up now. There it is there. These big um, star-forming regions are really the result of interaction, aren't they? Disturbance. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But what makes this one stand out is that 
we see lots of clusters around in the sky, you know, uh, uh, and they've got bright, bright, a few bright stars and then fainter stars, but this one is unusually bright. It's got over 100 stars, which are more than a million times brighter than the sun. And these are stars that are basically brand new. They're baby stars. And they're giants too in mass. Right. Yeah. They've, 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 just, they've just been born. As, um, as Kay pointed out, a star birth is often triggered by a shock wave going through the galaxy. And what creates the shock wave, ironically, is the star uh, in its death throes. So a star will explode as a supernova. Yeah. And the supernova sends shock waves out. And the shock waves create those star forming regions like the tarantula nebula mm. in the large Magellanic cloud. That's right, yeah, and it's the UV radiation from those eruptions which is illuminating the cloud in the first place. But Keith just mentioned explosions. <coughs> right? Explos big explosions, supernovas occur in big stars. But big stars don't live long. And here we've got 100 stars a million times brighter than the sun. These are all giants. So there's going to be a lot of major explosions occurring in the large Magellanic cloud starting any time soon. As you pointed out, they're all rather close, <laughs> aren't they? That's, that's right, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, this is going to be pretty awesome when we begin to see them in the night sky. Richard, if a star went supernova in, say, the large Magellanic cloud, would it have any effect on um, life on Earth? I would think it's too far away to, for, for that to happen. But what you will get, of course, is, is you get a lot of uh, extra radiation coming out from it and so on. The, actually, the, the, the most dangerous star out there is our own one. Our sun is the giver of life. Yes. But every now and again it erupts. It goes through a stages of where its activity changes. It gets very active and you get big eruptions on the sun and these can completely destroy the magnetic fields for a short period around, mm. the, around the Earth. And it's the magnetic fields that protect us from this dangerous radiation from space. Yeah. Yeah. So every time you see those beautiful things you call aurora, yes, <laughs> we're under nuclear attack. <laughs> yes. The roar is, that, is actually these, these uh, is this radiation crashing into the upper atmosphere. Mm. Yeah, that's all right. And all the astronomers are the guinea pigs because they all run out to have a look at them. <laughs> of course we do. Yeah, of course we do. Now the small cloud, on the other hand, is even further away. It's two hundred and three, two hundred and four thousand light years away, and it's got a weird shape again. Its diameter is only 7,000 light years and it's got six and a half billion stars. But it looks like it's been torn apart. And indeed, we'll, it's just the angle we're looking at it, but it looks like it's being shredded. Now, when you look at the small Magellanic cloud in a telescope or binoculars, you'll notice a big fuzzy st bright star next to it. Well, that's no star at all. Um, this thing is called 47 Tucane. And the reason why it's called 47 Tucane when it was originally uh, ma uh, mapped out, you know, centuries ago, it's in the constellation of the Toucan, and it appeared to be the 47th brightest star in that. So it's called 47 Tucane. Not particularly bright then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but uh, there's some pretty bright stars in the Toucan. Okay, now, but the thing is, this is no star. This is what we call a globular star cluster, right? Now, for those who voice it, it contains hundreds of thousands of stars but the interesting thing about these stars is they're ancient right these these stars we're looking at whereas those in the magellanic cloud are relatively young the 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 the, the um stars these globular clusters have enormous ages going back virtually to the birth time of the solar system uh, the galaxy itself Before, and you're saying that it's not actually related to the small not, magellanic cloud not related it's actually to related to the yeah. milky way no it's only about it's only about uh, fifteen thousand light years so away. it's a milky way globular cluster yes absolutely yeah yeah, and that's that's it. You can, when you look up into the sky, you can, you, you've got no measurement of depth with your eyes. You know, th two things appear close together in the sky, but they may be enormous distances apart. Yeah. So we've just seen a, um, uh, a region where baby stars are being born, and now we're looking at a region uh, full of very old stars. That's right. Yeah. Uh, how old are the stars in 47 Tucane? Uh, 
Uh, probably going back around about 12,000 million years or something yes. in that region. Yeah, they're ancient, right? They're formed at the beginning. They were the first things, as far as we can see, they're amongst the first structures formed in the Milky Way yeah. galaxy. There'd be the nucleus, which has got a similar age and so on, yeah. But there are lots of globular clusters around galaxies, aren't they? They're sort of like flies swarming around a... Well, that's right, yeah. yeah. Or they're, bees swarming around yeah. a honeypot or something. Well, originally, if you take yeah. the centre of the galaxy, it's, it's virtually circular, right? It's an orb. And then you've got this halo around it, which is the globular clusters, right? Mm. And then what's happened is that the remaining dust and gas that's come in is spun up and forms a disk around the, that central region which is where the sun is and other stars we see in the night sky yeah yeah so there you are so we're going to have a closer look which we're doing at the moment with the james webb telescope looking at these things and what you find is unlike looking across the milky way galaxy where the brightest stars tend to be blue or white the brightest stars in the 47 Tucani are all red giant stars. That means they're dying, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. So they're, they're ending their lifespan. Yeah. yeah. But a red giant a, a red giant is a medium mass star similar to our sun or a little bit brighter that's turned into a red giant. The red supergiants that we see when you talk about a supergiant, we see those in, uh, in our galaxy. They're giant stars. But these these are ordinary stars. This is telling. So when you talked about Antares, which is a red star, which is that? Is that it's a red supergiant. It's a yeah. supergiant. Yeah, yeah, mm. super. Yeah. Okay, okay, folks. Briefly, we go back and have a look at the north, uh, turning around to the north, and of course, directly in front of us, we've got the um, the Great Square. This is around about eight o'clock in the evening, folks. So it's just after this. It's got dark, right? And using the Great Square. If you come down at a right angle between the two, you come to this hazy patch of light in the sky. And we had a look at this last night. This hazy patch of light, again, is the most distant thing that you can see with the unaided eye. This is the great galaxy in Andromeda, M31. It is a spiral galaxy, slightly bigger than our galaxy, right? And it's over two million light years away, right? But there's some interesting things about it. Our, our, our Milky Way galaxy is not just on its own out there in, in the universe. It's a part of a cluster. And in that cluster are three big galaxies. The Milky Way, M31, and another spiral galaxy called M33. And then there's a whole host of smaller galaxies as well. All right? What I've just pulled up is a photograph of another galaxy, but it's, got a, it's a good representation of what our Milky Way galaxy would look like if we could see it from afar, all right? And the arrow shows you where, if this, this was, if this was our Milky Way galaxy, it shows you where the sun would be, all right? Now we're gonna to come to the answer about where did the Magellanic clouds come from? Because recent observations of the Magellanic clouds, all right, have found that the comp chemical composition to them is very similar to the stars in M31. And we know what had happened is over a billion years ago, there was a close encounter between M31 and our galaxy. And stuff was ripped apart. So it may well be that our, our uh, uh, Milky Way galaxy has ripped this material from the, from the uh, great galaxy there. From the outskirts. Yeah. But it, only, it would have been stars. It would just been dust and gas because the, the stars themselves are only a billion years old. And then they, f they formed into a little... Were m they passing each other? Because sometimes galaxies sort of go through each other, but in this yeah. case they must have just oh, look, been passing. This, this was just, this, 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 just a, a, this was a close encounter, we believe. Yeah. However, I must okay. warn you that bang, yes, it's going to happen again because the, mil the M31 is heading directly towards us. And that won't be a glancing blow. Oh, no. This is going to be a full-on impact. Get, so get on. I tell you what, folks, it's going to be pretty spectacular. I've actually, for those of you watching this on TV, you can see an image of a galaxy in which this is actually occurring, where two spiral galaxies are colliding at the moment. They can actually pass through each other, can't they? Uh, yes and no. I think they get the gravitational films will rip things apart. They rip things apart, but there's still something yeah. of each one still yeah. exists. Yeah. Anyway, folks, yeah. don't worry about it because it's 
although it's rushing towards us at great speed, remember it's two, over two million light years away, it's going to be another billion years before it hits us, so we don't worry about that at the moment. This, uh, <laughs> this is all powered, you know, these collisions and these ripping apart, ripping apart of galaxies and so forth, it's all powered by gravity. Absolutely. All yeah. gravitational attraction that's, that's, right, that's yeah. causing this to happen. That's right, yeah. Mm. yeah. So we, when we look up at the night sky and things, we, everything appears to be still, but it's not everything is on the move everything is slowly changing with time it's a bit like we're snails <laughs> you know watching yeah. cars go by at 120k yeah <laughs> yeah anyway look i'm going to shut up for a moment because these guys are coming along and they're going to play you a piece of music now all right so we're going to have a little break and we're, then when we come back and we look at the night sky at a later stage all right. yeah thank you off you go guys I've got played this before, this one. It's called Little by Little. But, um, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's not as gloom doom as you think as it sounds, because I think we're on the right track. But <clears throat> I love doing this number with uh, Keith, because he's got some really nice keyboard bits in it. But in the key of A, he threw me. Oh, little by little. Little by little. Day by day. By little, somehow, we'll do that again. Little by little, little by little, day by day. Can't you see, I'm talking about your destiny, destiny, just don't stand there and say it's wrong, cause you've been standing far too long. Little by little, day by day Little by little Sometimes World, world, world In the darkest night Just look for the followers Of the light Your faces, brilliant sun, little by little, little by little, day by day. Little 
little by little, little by little, day by day. Loving you, you too. Thank you very much. And listen, if you'd like to see more Stefan and Keith, don't forget they're going to be out on our uh, Star of Bethlehem. And also when we kept a star date in January, they're going to be out there playing as well. So, yeah, it's going to be some great music. And if you've not experienced music out of the Henge, you should do. It's got very special properties. Absolutely. And hopefully we get that, that good weather as well. Anyway, because we're just about out of time now, wow. so a bit of rush on, it's, it's me yakking so much, you see. Just to point out that looking in our night sky, you can see some bright star. what appear to be bright stars there. Uh, they're planets, all right? So we've got Jupiter in the sky at the moment, and Saturn, which are the two giants in the solar system. Objects completely different from the Earth. I'll bring the Earth up to scale, there it is there. <laughs> well, so yeah, it's pretty small. These are giants, all right? And so those are both in our sky at the moment, right? Now, looking closely, we find that Saturn is in Capricornus and Jupiter is in Pisces, if you want to know which star signs are actually in at the moment. And rising up on the uh, horizon, of course, we have Matariki, right? Yeah. And we're actually looking at the stars as you would see them at dawn at the time of the Mali New Year. Right. So, but of course, we, you have to study them now in the in the comfort of a summer evening sky, rather than getting up at dawn in the middle of winter. Mm. Okay, and so there is another absolutely beautiful cluster. It contains several hundred stars, but the ones that we notice are the giant stars, which are all blue, white, hot stars. Yeah. So, and they're embedded in nebulosity, uh, gas and dust, which reflects the light of those blue stars. So that all stars are formed in clusters, and with the passage of time, the clusters disintegrate. Right. Well, it makes you think because I mean, our own star, the Sun, is a solitary, it's a solitary star, mm. and yet it was too was born in a cluster. Absolutely. So somewhere in the galaxy, because the stars all orbit uh, through the galaxy anyway. So somewhere in the galaxy is a long lost sibling, or maybe three or four or five siblings. Brothers and sisters out there. Brothers yeah. and sisters. Right. And own, actually, son. They've, been, they've, been, they've been looking for them. And just recently, one astronomer actually they might have found one by looking at the chemical composition is virtually identical to yeah. that of the sun. Yeah. So yeah. That's interesting. I mean, this is we're just getting into that with the James Webb Telescope, beginning to explore realms and regions which we simply couldn't do before. Okay, so now I've moved things on to show you what this, the stars would look at 1 a.m. in the morning, and I'll whiz briefly through this because we haven't got a lot of time left. You've got the, the ring shows you also uh, Matariki, and of course, following up behind that, rising up. You say when it came home from work, Kay, you saw Mars, didn't you? Yes. That's a big bright That was star. close to 10 yeah. o'clock yeah. in the evening. Yeah. Jupiter is still be above the horizon, Saturn set, but then we've got brilliant Mars in the sky. And Mars is bright. It only comes bright in our skies every two years. That's when we, the Earth and Mars make a close approach, which we call opposition. And that occurred on December the 8th. When we were at the closest point to Mars, right? and that, by the way, is when the Martians all launched their uh, their missiles at. Absolutely, yeah. The two planets are close <laughs> together. Yeah. So watch out. Yes, exactly. watch out. Like that. <laughs> so, so that big bright orange, and you can notice it. It's got a big bright orangey red color. Is is Mars? Okay, in the sky there, and then above, standing almost due north, we've got Orion, which is the sign of summer. All right, that's our summer sign there, and that's in the sky as well. And if you want to know where uh, Mars is, it's actually in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Okay, one final thing I should mention is meteors. Meteors are shooting stars. Every now and again we get a swarm of these, a meteor shower. There's going to be a big one coming up fairly soon, right, this month. They're called the Geminids because they come from the constellation of Gemini. And they're active between December the 7th and December the 17th. And they peak around about the 14th, where we might get up to 120 meteors an hour coming through. But folks, you've got to get up 
after midnight. It won't, you won't see it until about 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And look in the direction of the constellation Gemini, because that's, that's, that's where they appear. That's where they come. And, where they and, the, and the marker on the screen for those of watching shows you where the Gemini is. Anyway, folks, we're going to have to shut up now because um, it's the, we've run out of time. So, but just remember, Star of Bethlehem, all right, we've got that all coming up on December the 22nd on Thursday, and then we've got Stardate Festival on the uh, January. And I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs>